My name is Vesna Bojčić Jalilović. I'm senior fellow at LSE and co-director of UN Business and Human Security program. And it is my pleasure to chair this uh, session. When it comes to business contribution to broader uh, society, multi-actor collaboration and partnerships have become the preferred modality. So it's very popular to talk about this framework of, of collaboration and, and, and partnering as a superior form of collective action in, in development and security field. So we, we have seen a proliferation of multi-stakeholder uh, initiatives, but in fact, we know very little about how these uh, multi-actor arrangements with business form and operate. What are the challenges? What are the constraints? And uh, how, how these diverse actors work with uh, one another and I think this applies uh, in particular to the processes of collaboration at the local level, um, at the sites where the companies operate. And what we heard uh, in the first session, it's really the local level where this change and, uh, and impact in terms of, of human security mm -hmm. outcomes is most uh, directly felt and ultimately is decisive in what these ambitious um, uh, uh, ambitions and expectations around uh, collaborative frameworks uh, try, try and, and hope uh, to achieve. So we also know that many companies uh, have been doing uh, all, all sorts of, of, of activities to reach out and engage with, with uh, different uh, actors but then again, uh, not uh, enough of that knowledge is, is shared and widely known. And indeed, as, as one of our colleagues on the panel argues in one of his pa uh, papers, uh, uh, one way of thinking about this big agenda of business contribution to, to development, uh, peace and stability is to start learning from the bottom up and looking at this kind of trickling up uh, effects that this kind of uh, collaborative uh, efforts may eventually produce. So really the aim of this session is, is to get a first-hand insight into some of those experiences from the individuals with deep knowledge of those processes of company community uh, engagement in which they took part in some capacity. And we have with, with us a great panel whose experience spans four continents, uh, a range of industries and different country contexts. Uh, so what I will do is to start off with the, with the presentation from our panelists, and then we will just have a brief discussion among the panelists themselves before I open the floor uh, to questions and uh, answers from the audience. I would like uh, very much uh, that uh, if we could encourage audience to participate in the discussion and you can do so by posing your questions in the question and ans answer uh, uh, box uh, on your screen and please do that uh, throughout uh, the event and when you ask the question please identify yourself and if relevant uh, identify the panelists you, are, you, you, you would like to respond to your question. And I would also like uh, the panelists to keep an eye on the questions that, that are coming, just to make sure that maybe I overlook something that they, uh, they, they find particularly interesting uh, to, to respond and engage in. So uh, with that, I want to introduce our, our uh, uh, six panelists and I'll do it in the order they will be speaking. Uh, our first speaker is Mr. Phil Champagne, who is director of the Faith and Belief Forum. Uh, then uh, it, it is Ms. Marta Herrera, who is the global director of social impact at CEMEX. Mr. Jack, uh, Jackson Steer from the Consortium of Natural Resources, Resource Management in Liberia. Mr. Mark Van Dorp, who is the CEO of Bureau Van Dorp, and Mr. Christian Wenda, uh, who is uh, from the NGO Premi Congo in DRC, 
And our uh, final speaker is Mr. Juan uh, Andres Cano, CEO of Peace Startup in Colombia. Speakers' biographies is on the website, so please, uh, for more information, uh, vi visit the event's website. So let me now turn to our first speaker, Mr. Phil Champagne. Phil, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Vesna, and thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to be able to say a few words about um, the experience I've had connected to um, working with uh, business and other stakeholders in the Philippines. Um, my, I'm, I'm, as Vesna said, I'm the uh, director of the Faith and Belief Forum at the moment, and we're an organization that deal with um, uh, issues of identity, faith and belief. Um, mainly in the UK, but I also continue to do some work in the Philippines and in a previous life um, I worked for the International Peace Building Organization, International Alert. Um, I'd like to share my screen, I hope I can do that, I'm going to try and do that just so that I can be assisted with some slides here. Um, uh, what I'd like to do is to, first of all, give you, in, in the 10 minutes I've got, I'd like to just give you a, a brief background to this initiative that I'm going to talk about, which is a very kind of practical, it's a bit of a case study, really. Um, uh, give you a bit of background, talk a little bit about um, the process um, to give you a flavour of what uh, what was done and then to draw out some of the key lessons. So first of all the background, this is um, Power, Peace and Place is the is the title of the publication that, um, that, that I was fortunate to pull together documenting the experience of those involved in this initiative um, which was published recently. Um, so it's about a power company, um, it's, it's it's about the way the power company engaged in Mindanao in the Southern Philippines, which is uh, an area uh, continuing to suffer the impacts of violent conflict. And place is, I'll come back to that because place is really the, if you like, the, the, the kind of key, one of the key learnings is, is it's that attachment that different stakeholders have to place. But I'll come back to that. The, the kind of key group, this story is about a group of people, a multi-stakeholder group um, drawn from the energy company uh, Boites, but also from local government and uh, civil society representatives and, and local community groups. Um, and they formed this group, which was called, or well, it's called, it's still operational, called the Davao, Davao um, which is the, the capital of Mindanao, uh, multi-stakeholder group for energy concerns. Um, so Demjenko, as they're called, are the, the key group, multi-stakeholder group that was formed, and, and that's, that's them in the middle there. Um, Mindanao on the, on the right, that picture just indicating the conflict, um, that this is a, a sort of uh, area of violent conflict that many of you will know about, of course. And it's important also to say on, on the right, the, the sort of key um, a key organization who um, who was was pushing this forward really um, and was uh, and published the the case study is international alert um, the, the kind of brief that we were given for this presentation was really around um, sort of constructive mutual relations in the context of human security and and the, the, the sustainable development goals. And, but in this terms of this, this case study, we answered, asked a bit of a different but related question, which was um, why do firms account for their actions? What drives them to account for their actions? Why should they? Um, what's their motivation? Um, and I suppose this is against the background that, that Nikki De La Rosa, who's the director, um, the country director of International Alert in the Philippines says that, um, you know, business, excuse my dog, I think we got a dog in a, a previous uh, presentation, um, uh, that uh, the businesses uh, ought to help in building a lasting peace, yet, yet while um, peace is good for business, um, uh, the re reverse is not, uh, is not true enough. Um, 
So this is against the background of really trying to sort of challenge the notion that businesses need to go further than do no harm, CSR, as we was referenced previously in, in previous presentations. Three SDGs sort of uh, stand out for me in terms of this case study. It's about an energy. So it's about an energy a company and it's about the, the, the kind of right of people to affordable clean energy. That relates to climate action. And the third that really jumps out, the 17 SDGs is, is peace, justice and, um, uh, and strong institutions. So the, the, the background, just a bit of the background for the background at Boite's Power, they have a long standing presence in Mindanao. They've been working there for about 100 years, in fact. Um, persistent violent conflict, I've, I've referred to the struggle for independence amongst the predominantly Muslim people of, uh, of, of Mindanao um, within a predominantly Catholic state, uh, the state of the Philippines. Um, there, there was a strong need for energy and development in, and this, this is the link to the access question to en energy. Um, really this started in 2012 when there were long, you know, extended brownouts, um, energy shortages, lack of um, uh, development in the region, um, persistent poverty. Um, so a real need for energy, but at the same time, a strong no to coal lobby, environmental lobby, um, which was related to, uh, uh, to climate change uh, pressures. Um, the other significant point in terms of the background is the work of International Alert, the NGO International Alert, which had been working in the Philippines for, for quite some time. And, and I would say one of the pioneers, certainly in the Philippines, on this notion of conflict sensitive business practice and what business could do to help address the combined challenges of um, persistent violent conflict and then lack of development um, uh, and sustained poverty of which kind of lack of energy was, was key. So this was the scene really, it's um, a power company if you like seeing an opportunity for, uh, for delivering energy, but at the same time, um, uh, you know, a lot of challenges, not only in terms of violent conflict, but in terms of the, the climate change lobby. Um, uh, right, okay. Um, what I want to do is to go on and, and talk a bit about the kind of meat of the case study. Um, <clears throat> I want to kind of talk a bit about Hirschman's exit voice and loyalty framework here. This is what we use to try and kind of assess uh, or to try and come at the question of why the companies uh, account for their action and, and what works in terms of a multi-stakeholder process you know Demjenko as they're called is a multi-stakeholder group um, trying to address the the need for energy um, amidst multiple problems and 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 hurdles if you like so why did it work in the end I think it did work to a large extent but we used Hirschman's uh, exit vo voice and loyalty framework really to try and work that out a bit. So what I'm gonna talk about is, is really the dialogue process. Um, so there's a bit of granularity here in terms of, of how this operated. And, and what this framework here seeks to show is that, you know, Hirschman's framework really was say, sort of posing, you know, that, that, that if, a, if, a, if a consumer has a problem with the product, then they can either exit or they can voice their dissatisfaction. Um, but what in terms of that framework, you know, why did the community, civil society, the No to Coal Coalition, um, you know, why did they choose to engage in a dialogue project with a large energy company? Why didn't they exit that? And what, what enabled them to stay in that process? Um, there's a lot of detail in the in the in the publication, obviously, but for, in the in the kind of um, the limited time I've got, the points I'd like to make here are that that one really voice was the key to the loyalty that that the people that from the community felt um, towards the company and 
uh, and others. So the reason they stayed with the process was really they had a sense of loyalty to that process. Why did they have that sense of loyalty to the process? The issue fundamentally was about voice, but it was also about that voice. I mean, we heard from previous presentations the importance of business to listen. It wasn't only about listening, it was about acting. So it's about voice, but it's also about the relationship satisfaction that comes from those voices be, being acted on. And by that, I mean problem solving. So the dialogue group came together. They, they, uh, they addressed issues that were fundamentally uh, important to them within the, the, the energy provision project. And they saw problems being solved by the company and therefore stuck with the process. They remained loyal to the process. I just want to say something briefly about what those problems were. I'll give you a, a list of some of them. Um, here there are a whole mixture, but for the, for the interests of the, the kind of those involved, they were interested in, yes, um, sort of, uh, they were interested in job opportunities at the bottom. Um, they were interested in water supply issues. They were interested, yes, those bigger problems of resettlement and compensation, which the uh, not only the energy company was 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 kind of connected to, but it was also related to their proximity to um, to the the uh, to the ocean and climate change pressures. Um, but they were also wanted um, uh, sort of action on fly ash, on odor on respiratory problems that were coming from the energy, uh, energy initiatives. So the important thing here in terms of um, the framework is that problems were put up, but the, the, the energy company were then seen to be addressing them. Um, and this was key to the, the communities staying with, um, with the process. So, I suppose when I heard from previous presenters saying it's important companies listen, that's true. But I think the step that is also critical for those involved in dialogue processes with them is for those issues that they raise to be ad addressed. I think what Aboitis Power managed to do is to solve a lot of the problems. Some of them are some of them are still outstanding. Interestingly, the biggest one around resettlement and compensation is outstanding. Um, and the other issue that is outstanding is this, this energy uh, initiative is about a coal fired power station. They talk about clean coal, but ultimately um, it's not a renewable energy company. Um, and this goes back to uh, the need for energy in this region. There seemed to be a, um, an acceptance amongst those involved in the dialogue initiatives that, that they, would, they would accept the clean coal power plant as a necessity in the short term, although they were continuing to, to kind of work for renewable energies in the long term. The key learnings that we can get, I just want to move on to learnings in my final minutes that I've got. Some of the learnings from this dialogue initiative are that, that, um, that what was key, and I said that Aboites was engaged in this area for about 100 years. Um, what was interesting from the group was that they shared a lot of social networks um, those who worked in the local council, those from the communities, those from the company, they used the same churches, they knew each other, they didn't necessarily agree all the time, but they were part of the same social networks. And that goes back to this issue of place. There was a connection to place and an interest in the place that they all lived and engaged with, which somehow knitted them together. The other key learning was that voice was central to determining loyalty, but the ability to, of the group to address and solve problems that were voiced was critical to that building of trust. Um, the fourth was the facilitation of International Alert, the NGO, was important as a, as a kind of actor in that dialogue process. And finally, the presence of champions within the company, uh, within this big company, was also central. 
I don't think this initiative would have worked without key people within the energy company um, pushing for the company to go beyond the do no calm to actually solve problems and to be seen as delivering for the community of which they felt uh, they were a part. Finally, uh, final reflections. <coughs> I think this case study shows that if to be effective um, in these dialogue processes and multi-stakeholder dialogue processes, the company has to go beyond the bottom line. Um, it has to embrace this notion that it's attached to place and the people in it and that social capital matters and matters to them as it matters to others. Um, I think this case study also shows that, you know, the, the issues that affect us um, as human beings, uh, you know, are numerous, they can drive us apart, but if social capital can pr be protected and harnessed, then it can also lead to innovation. Um, I think finally, um, I think everyone involved in this initiative felt that they had a stake in the future of the region, and this goes back to the importance of place. So my final word really is, uh, is that, that final P of place, that I don't think we can get away from the need for the company, as well as the other actors involved, to, to feel an attachment and a, and, a, and a kind of engagement with the place where they are operating. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil. That was uh, incredibly interesting and rich. And I think even though uh, you, you say you, know, you approach your, your, your um, study um, with a different question, it really speaks the same language, you know, that, that, that dri drives our research. And I think this point about about company being embedded in local society and seeing itself through that lens and harvesting social capital, it's, it's absolutely uh, fundamental for keeping this kind of uh, engagement and, and constructive uh, dialogue over time. And I think also uh, the point about it's not uh, only enough to get everybody's voices heard, communities in particular, but also that some action is, is uh, taken so that there is a commitment so that even when one of the, of the problems, the resettlement problem remains outstanding, there is still space for con continuing conversation and looking for solutions, you know, so somewhere down the line in future. Really, really, some interest, interesting insights uh, from, from from the Philippines example. Thank you. Uh, if I may now turn to our sec second speaker, Miss Marta Herrera. Marta, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you allow me to put uh, my presentation also. Uh, greetings from uh, Mexico. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be here with you and I want to thank the LSE IDEA for inviting us to, to participate in this great experience. Uh, today I will share our experience of taking part uh, also in multi-stakeholder initiatives with a particular emphasis on engaging with uh, local communities. Uh, for me this is key to understand uh, the challenges of course but also the opportunities uh, for business activities in the communities with different kinds of allies. And then I will also uh, uh, go into conclusions with some learnings and recommendations. Um, as you know, even before the pandemic, uh, the world was already facing major economic, social and environmental challenges like uh, the great inequalities across uh, regions such as Latin America uh, with um, uh, racing uh, poverty, uh, the lack of quality education, gender inequalities, the climate change crisis, among many other challenges. And but on the other on the other hand, we also have seen that the pandemic has enabled and even strengthened our work uh, uh, with international agencies, with governments, with businesses, with civil society, working together to tackle these um, uh, short-term and long-term challenges with a lot of innovation uh, to bring uh, these multi-stakeholder initiatives into place. Uh, at CEMEX, we have been uh, committed to collaborating to find solutions 
through sustainable business models with social and environmental impact uh, that offer different alternatives, for example, in affordable housing, in efficient buildings, in resilient infrastructure, powered by technology, innovation, and, and constant evolution. Uh, for those unfamiliar with CEMEX, uh, we leave our purpose to build a better future through the provision of uh, building materials and solutions, fostering more sustainable and resilient uh, cities and communities. Um, uh, CEMEX was founded more than 115 years ago, and we are currently operating in 50 countries. Um, as you know, the uh, uh, SDGs represent business opportunities for all of us, and in CEMEX, we have made a clear commitment to the 2030 agenda, particularly on the SDG number 11, which is connected to our business strategy and allow us to have a broader impact in building sustainable cities and communities. And through this approach, we continue to be committed to people, society and planet, uh, together with uh, SDGs uh, number eight, uh, nine, 13 and 15, all uh, related to our business strategy. Uh, one of the major paradigm shifts uh, has been the essential role uh, companies like ours have in society and ever increasing business engagement as a key partner in development. Uh, for many years um, uh, at CEMEX, our stakeholders um, are vital partners in maximizing our positive impact on more than 5,000 uh, communities in which we operate around the world. And through our engagement, a stakeholder engagement strategy that is guided by our values and human rights principles, we have a very close relationship, as Phil was saying, not only as listening, but also as acting uh, on one hand with deep dialogues, but uh, the, those deep dialogues allow us to really uh, uh, help on the development of capabilities and co-create plans within the different territories. We, we yearly revise our community engagement plans that allow us to co-create initiatives with community partners along uh, with all other key partners around the, 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 the different context. As a result of our experience, we develop our sustainable community model in which we empower the community uh, by helping in, in developing capabilities that ensure that they will lead initiatives along with different partners in the long term. And, and, and at CEMEX, we accelerate this change and seek to ensure that we are really contributing to a sustainable future by reaching out to stakeholders, enabling our sustainable, uh, sustainability community methodology uh, uh, along with other partners. Since decades ago, we have a, a clear strategy to create partnerships and, and finding the right allies for the different strategic, operational, and, and cultural main access of the cooperation. We have worked together with government, with community partners, with other companies, even with competition, uh, with entrepreneurs, with academia, with media, international cooperation uh, with different UN agencies and other local or organizations that are key uh, and that have the necessary expertise and to, uh, to really scale up efforts uh, globally. In the first approach, we seek to, uh, key potential allies through knowledge sharing practices uh, with co-investment and capacity development through pilot initiatives. Through time, those potential allies become partners uh, which allow us to build through partnerships through time and also allow us to share a common vision, which for me is key, to build these stake, uh, multi-stakeholder initiatives, which represent uh, challenges be uh, because they are complex. Uh, but also for us, the best way to do things uh, is by these uh, same uh, multi-stakeholder initiatives because the problems are also complex. We also engage with leading academic, academic institutions and invest in initiatives that deliver environmental, social, and economic impacts. We use the roadmap of the 2030 agenda, which enable us to share common vision with these 17 goals. Um, and, and by tackling, uh, uh, by taking this multi-stakeholder approach, we, we really um, uh, allow to, to focus on uh, um, strengthening these alliances with a human-centered approach and, and with clear indicators that allow us to measure 
the gaps and have a true accountability of our actions. We are convinced that no single company or government can address these complex societal challenges alone. And that's why every actor can bring something to the table. Uh, for example, last year, the hospital infrastructure was challenged by a, a, a spiking number of COVID cases in different cities around the world. And to treat patients infected by the COVID in Mexico, CEMEX currently uh, uh, build uh, 17 mobile hospitals, adding more than si uh, 691 beds in two weeks. Uh, this was a milestone only possible for uh, in partnerships. We collaborated with the Mexican government in coordination with more than 20 multi-stakeholder -st partners, and we find a solution that was scalable, replicable internationally, and that provides savings uh, around 60% of savings versus traditional solutions. Another example is the work we have done between academia and the private sector, which has been key for, for research and development and applied sciences at CEMES. Uh, we have fostered this for many years. Uh, an alliance we have been uh, doing for 10 years now is with, with the Monterey Tech, which is a, a private university based uh, in, with uh, 36 campus along Mexico, which is one of the pioneers in entrepreneurial education in Latin America. And we, by this, we aim to transfer knowledge, provide tools, and promote the development of capabilities and skills in the different communities in which we work. Our activities are guided by our sustainable communities models, which is now present in, in all our communities around the world with more than a, a thousand allies that we have. This model shows our vision of sustainability as an integral multidisciplinary concept with five lenses, the environmental quality, the social and economic development, as well as the housing and urban planning. Also across Latin America, we have worked together uh, for 15 years with Red America, which is a network of companies and foundations in, in 13 countries. And we have been focusing on strengthening grassroots organizations, which are focusing on, on early education, on youth and women, on early uh, on environmental protection and uh, on strengthening local governments and territories in, across Latin America. We also have been working with UN Global Company in Mexico and other com countries and uh, res the resilient alliances um, for, for resilient communities around the world with uh, UN agencies. CEMES uh, has also developed a multi-stakeholder multi alliance in rural and urban uh, areas, particularly in local and national communities that allow us to replicate an scalable project. Uh, I will share only one example. For example, in, in 2015, CEMEX decided to strengthen our urban transformation strategy by piloting a sustainable and resilient community model in one of the most marginalized and unsafe urban community in the north of Mexico, Campana Altamira, uh, in a multi-stakeholder alliance with the federal government, the municipal government, um, the NGO and the Tech of Monterrey to, to establish an interinstitutional council for development in this territory. We develop a common agenda based on a very comprehensive master plan for development of the Campana Altamira that we develop uh, and address seven priorities, which is security, social inclusion, economic inclusion, urban inclusion, housing, education, and health. And for each of the allies, uh, allies that we participate in different committees in which we have strategic strengths and expertise, the initiative has three governance levels, the strategic, the technical, and the community. At the strategic level, we seek greater decision-making and influence capacity. On the technical level, there is a, a coordination committee and six working groups. And at the community level, a neighborhood council aims to develop the, the community inhabitants and agents, leaders, and decision makers in, the, in their own development. And, uh, and with this, we work with 12 neighborhood councils and community committees that in, were involved in the decision making process all along. The achievements, we have uh, achieved three main things. The coordination committee with six coordinating groups, the development plan, with several main areas and influence in public policy with different results. We, we, we have been uh, studying data from uh, 215 to 2020, and we can see that there was an increase in household, uh, household weekly income. 
Uh, there was also an increase in drinking water network coverage, uh, an increase in uh, security by reducing robbery, reduction of lack of access to health services. 90% um, of the people said that they are proud to belong to this community. Uh, and the people, part, uh, and, and almost 20% of the people participate in these neighborhood communities. So this was possible thanks to the sustained and incremental investment during this period, and also because of the increased uh, participation of civil uh, citizen participation in the decision making process. And we will continue to work in this community with free projects in drinking water, in, in a health center, adult education community, among other things, of course, investing uh, uh, um, uh, within uh, the, the, all the allies. Um, um, among the learnings, I will close in saying that uh, uh, we face, of course, a lot of challenges, which led to a lot of learnings. Uh, three key learnings for me is trust. We need to develop trust to have a transparent and long-term partnership. Uh, we have put people at the center. Um, uh, we never forget to keep people at the center, which for us was vital to really promote development uh, and drive systemic transformation in this community and multi-stakeholder collaboration. Uh, for us, it was key to have this. Some recommendations for me, there are um, 10 key words uh, that came to mind when, 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 uh, uh, when talking about all these partnerships that we have developed over time. One is synergies. The whole is, is more than the sum of the parts. We have to build legitimacy. We have to think of scale and replication. Cooperation is key. Uh, the needs are many, but often they are the same. So we, we together can find better answers. Creativity, the best solutions are, are those that really came from the collaborative co-creation, specifically on, on local opportunities. There are more opportunities than there are challenges. A diversity, a, a network that is a diverse group of actors uh, make a, a, a platform of growth and enrich the social offerings. Motivation, we have to learn the motivation of each of the allies, which actors are really needed to be included. And lastly, communicate, communicate, and communicate and measure progress. So thank you for listening. We are very proud to believe in our purpose to be agents of change. And we are sure that uh, there are big opportunities out there to work together and be part of this transformation that the world needs. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Ms. Herrera. This is an extremely kind of rich, uh, almost to the force uh, overview of what CEMEX has been doing. And I think uh, just the spread of, of action that the company is engaged in uh, to make um, highlights this uh, need to institutionalize it because you do work across so many different contexts whereas in the first case Phil uh, was talking about the Philippines uh, local initiative here we have a sense of what what it takes if the company really wants to do it on, on a much broader broader scale uh, thank you. Uh, let me now pass on floor to uh, uh, Mr. Jackson Spear to tell us about his experience of working with uh, concession companies in Liberia. Jackson, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to everyone. Hi, Phil. <laughs> I used to work with right. international. I used to work with international. <laughs> nice to see you, Jackson. <laughs> okay. So thank you. I'll tell you a little bit about my experience working with uh, uh, multinational companies. Uh, a brief history about Liberia. As you know, Liberia is a tanning country on the west coast of Africa. Uh, tanning in the sense that uh, we have a population of about 40, uh, uh, as about, about uh, uh, a little over 5 million people with uh, a land space of 43,000 square meters. Liberia is uh, endowed with a lot of resources, um, gold, diamond, iron ore. Liberia currently has 40% of the, the forests of the Upper Guinea you know, region. Unfortunately, uh, all of those 
have really uh, ended up becoming a curse for Liberia because if you go through the 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 uh, fragility assessment report, uh, you realize that uh, one of the reasons for the conflict that Liberia has, uh, Liberia had, and continue to suffer because. Um, we, we, we still think that uh, we are not out of the woods yet. We have a lot of challenges around natural resource management. And so one of the key reasons is the unequal distribution of the proceeds from these resources. And so uh, as a result of that, when I work with the, the, with the UN, specifically the United Nations Industrial Development, uh, uh, organization, we were concerned about conflict as a result of res resources. And what do we do? What new innovations we can introduce? Someone said in a previous uh, section, the whole issue about corporate social responsibility was not sufficient. Truth is not sufficient because despite all of this, Liberia has since uh, 1926 uh, explored its resources for development purpose. Yet, if you compare uh, the rural areas, the real owners of these resources to the, the, the people in the city, you, you, you will see, you clearly will see the disparity between the two. And so when we had this war, people got a little bit uh, uh, knowledgeable about what they're supposed to benefit from, from these resources. So you in working, with the country what's concerned about what do we do in order to address this particular issue. And so we introduced something we call, uh, a project we call promoting social civilization through the creation of jobs and livelihood opportunities. We've worked on that, that project for, for the past three years. Unfortunately, we had planned to scale up because we work with four of Liberia 15 counties. Unfortunately, the corona broke out in March of last year. And so we had to abandon the project. Currently, the project is closed. So we, we, what we did was to establish a multi-stakeholder platform that brought together people from the communities, people from the, the transnational corporations, the, the, the technical vocational institutions, civil society, and the government. And our concern was to explain and clearly design rules and responsibility for each of the parties in, with the hope that all of the party will, will, you know, will, will use this as an opportunity and you know, a, a beginning point to scale up. So if we succeed, we could replicate uh, that model across the country. When we explain to especially the multinational companies or the transnational companies, so to speak, they all were excited about the process. The government was excited, the companies were excited, civil society of course was, was excited and ready to go. The communities were fully involved from the start and ready to go, and all of that. In the implementation of our project, we got to realize one key lesson. We got to realize that uh, the companies, the transnational companies, were divided into two categories as a result of that it affected our initial planning. One, we discovered that there were companies that were here in Liberia before the war and had lived, for example, Firestone, for example, uh, uh, the, the Liberia Agricultural Company and several other companies. Because of the, the, the time they've lived through Liberia, they've learned to adopt the strategies to satisfy the government around them. They didn't care about which government they were working with, uh, which government came to power. Remember, Liberia had a history of coups, counter coups, and wars, and all of that. So they adopted the strategy to satisfy the power that be. That particular group of companies became very, very difficult to work with 
They did not believe that they would go, should go back, you know, and redesign the strategy to work with community. As far as they were concerned, they were paying taxes. They were satisfied with uh, the relationship with government. And so everything else was secondary. There was another group of companies we discovered that came post crisis period. That group were keen to, re to realize that uh, there were a lot of international voluntary protocols that were associated with, 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 with uh, the repetition that was associated with security and all of that. So they were keen to observe and ensure that this multi multi stakeholder platform was something good to work along with. Unfortunately for them, in Liberia, there are uh, 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 some field level managers of these companies who do not, uh, who do not have the capacity to, to, to make decisions at these multi stakeholder meetings. So we'll go there, we'll discuss all the issues, you know, come up with some fine plans. Unfortunately, you know, we get direct back because this company were not forthcoming. And so we, we you know, for example, uh, Atlamita, we approached Atlamita when we started this, they agreed to do that, but it took them two years to finally join the project, to finally sponsor some of the community for the training. So in the previous uh, 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 panel, people talked about the role of the government. I think in all of our discussion, I think the role of government is very, very crucial to ensuring that these, because I got to believe, as, as, for example, uh, uh, companies that, you know, especially came after the war, who are keen on you know, putting into practice these international protocols, these UN protocols and these international protocols. However, government, especially within our context, have a serious and a key role to play in ensuring that when these companies come to the table, to come to the table with the understanding that when these issues are raised and are brought up and plans are made that all of the stakeholders seek to you know what we have agreed other than that you know the whole issue about reverting the conflict the whole issue about uh, uh, re conflict relapse is very very uh, uh, i mean it's 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 something that is on the verge of possibility and that's one of our experiences in working with these multinational companies. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jackson. What I uh, kind of pick pick up from from your presentation are several very very important points. It's really this uh, heterogeneity of, of, of the business sector. I mean, you do talk about uh, companies with long history of presence in, in Liberia and who prioritize their relationship with government and really follow this, this logic of, you know, responsibility stops with doing business, paying taxes, and then the new breed of companies uh, which are more inclined to Complying with international standards, so you know that the, the, for us, I think uh, that there is an issue uh, uh, there to to unpack and, and 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 understand better. You know what what does it mean in terms of, of uh, multi-actor collaboration? Um, the the second point is this point. Uh, the, it's about at which level. Uh, um, within uh, company structure do you engage? And as, as if we are saying, you know, that it's the local level, then it's, it's problematic if uh, at that level, at the operational level, you have, you have uh, um, com company officials who actually have no authority to 
implement some some of some of some of the um, uh, uh, things that 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 have been uh, agreed at at, at a diff different level. And I think thirdly, and that that really strikes me, you know, as relevant uh, in, in in comparative terms, is the role of government. In 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 your case, you know, what what government can do to to uh, move these uh, types of of uh, 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 collaborative arrangements in, in a more constructive direction. So a lot of food of thought uh, for thought. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, now I'll pass on the floor to uh, Mark and Christian if he has managed to connect. Mark, if not. Uh, no, Christian is not uh, there yet. So I'll just start and uh, do the presentation on my own. Uh, let me share my screen for the PowerPoint. Okay, so um, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Mark van Dorp. I uh, uh, collaborate with Christian Buenda from uh, Premi Congo. Unfortunately, uh, it's actually um, also, assigned the times, he wasn't able to connect because of the curfew in uh, in DRC, because he had to uh, to go home instead of staying in the office. Um, but he's, uh, you know, we actually worked uh, very closely on this uh, case study, so I'm also speaking on behalf of him. Uh, and the title of our presentation is uh, "How Civil Society Engaged with a Chinese Mining Company to Improve Human Security and Community Rights in DRC." And well, uh, for those who don't know DRC very well, uh, actually the name of the company is uh, CNMC Wachin Mabende. Um, uh, CNMC is uh, one of the lar larger uh, mining com companies in China. And this is one of their subsidiaries in, uh, in, in the province of uh, Otkatanga, uh, in the southeast of DRC, bordering Zambia. And they are mainly involved in uh, copper and cobalt mining. And as uh, you know, you you may know, cobalt is actually one of the key components of uh, car batteries, um, laptops, mobile phones, but also healthcare systems. So it's really a, a very crucial resource for for many industries. And more than fifty percent of uh, of the global cobalt production comes from DRC. So, um, well, hence the, the interest of, of uh, multinational companies in, uh, in this uh, resource. And to, you know, just to uh, illustrate the, this uh, point of the strategic importance, uh, I want to show you a newspaper I brought uh, three years ago from Congo. I don't know if it's visible, but it says, Cobalt, uh, la guerre a déjà commencé. which means uh, the war has already started. And this actually is uh, referring to the, the war in Eastern Congo in the Kivus, which is mainly about uh, coltan um, and other resources like the, the 3TG. Um, and there has been less, less of a, a spotlight on, uh, on Katanga uh, because the, the conflict has not really been um, so pronounced there, it's more of a, a latent conflict um, with less violence, but um, for sure uh, a huge lack of, um, of human security and uh, a big um, number of problems as well for, for local communities. So these uh, problems were actually uh, assessed by uh, Premi Congo, by my colleague first Christian, uh, who is based in Lubumbashi and um, you know, has been uh, doing a field research for the last uh, five, six years on the activities of this company. And they found that uh, the main issues were the loss of land uh, of communities due to deforestation by the company, um, the lack of compensation, water pollution, um, and the restriction on the freedom of circulation because the company actually uh, built a new road, but it was uh, not accessible to the local people, which uh, uh, is something that's very common for, for not only mining companies, but also forest companies. 
and others. And there was, uh, well, also classic, of course, elective consultation. Um, so just to show you uh, some, some pictures, this is uh, actually the only water point where the local community could, had access to clean drinking water. Um, because the, the company, you know, they didn't have any uh, chemical waste disposal. So the, the water, all the water sources around the company were uh, so polluted that the community could not drink it anymore. Um, in the picture on the left, you see the, the forest destruction by the company. Um, they had no permission. There was no consultation on who, who owned the land. Um, and the picture on the right is actually a local school, um, just to show you the level of development uh, of the region. And the lack of proper um, uh, educational facilities. So, um, you know, when Premi Congo was uh, actually doing all this research, they published a number of reports uh, with the support of, uh, of SOMO, uh, which I was working for but at that time. Uh, SOMO is a Dutch NGO uh, doing research on multinational corporations. And, you know, these. Um, all these reports were, of course, shared with the company. They, they tried to have a conversation with the company's management. Um, there was no response, nothing. They didn't want to go into dialogue with the, with the community, nor with, um, with the CSOs. So um, actually, you know, this was the, uh, the moment when we realized, you know, if the company doesn't want to, um, to solve the issue, we, maybe we need to take it to a, a higher level. And, um, you know, at SOMO, uh, we, there's a lot of uh, experience with international grievance mechanisms. Um, but uh, actually, the sort of the consensus within the NGO community is that uh, it's two things, that Chinese companies don't care about human rights. Uh, and secondly, that uh, they cannot be held to account because uh, you know, they are not part of the OECD, so the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises um, do not apply. Um, although that remains to be seen in some cases where they have subsidiaries in OECD countries. Um, and, but um, also because, um, you know, there were no, no standards uh, up till recently for Chinese companies. And that actually changed in uh, 2014 with the publication of, um, of the due diligence guidelines of the China Chamber of Commerce of Metals, Minerals and Chemicals, the so-called CCCMC. Um, and, you know, so we were thinking, even though the, the guidelines did not provide for a complaint mechanism, it was announced but never um, operationalized. We thought it, it was worth a try to, uh, to file a complaint. Actually, as far as we know, it's the first time a complaint was raised uh, at the CCCMC. Um, so together with the local um, communities, the, the, all these issues were, were put into a complaint, sent to the company in 2018. And uh, after that, it took one and a half years for the company to respond. Um, well, you know, a lot of things happened in between, uh, a lot of, especially non-communication and, uh, and frustration on the part of the communities because they were still on the same, uh, uh, problem. And then, uh, finally last year, uh, there was a breakthrough because the company, you know, uh, they actually invited, uh, Premi Congo to, to do a joint visit because they actually, um, denied the allegations, which we also see uh, very often that companies simply, you know, uh, deny that there's a problem and sometimes even uh, threaten uh, NGOs with uh, court cases. I think in Liberia, this is also very common. Um, but nevertheless, they, you know, somehow they started to realize that they had to do something. So they announced some tangible improvements including the proper disposal of chemical waste to solve the, the water problem. And, and um, Christian told me that uh, uh, very recently, uh, actually as we speak, um, 
there's a number of um, discussions ongoing with the company to discuss all the other issues that uh, were raised in consultation with the traditional chiefs and with Premier Congo and to develop this into a so-called cahier de charge, which is uh, well loosely translated as a community development plan, which is actually, um, uh, I don't know if it's a legal obligation, but it's, uh, it's very common in, in Francophone Africa that companies, you know, develop a plan with the community to, uh, uh, to build uh, some, uh, you know, like um, facilities like education and, and healthcare. And, you know, very, the tangible uh, things that they are currently discussing is the building of, uh, or the opening of the roads that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, also the uh, building of a number of schools. So, well, that's at least some good news. Um, just to finish, uh, I would like to share three lessons learned that, uh, that we, um, you know, we can conclude from this case. First of all, that context plays a key role. And of course, this is not a, um, uh, this is nothing new, but um, it's important to, to every time to realize that, you know, whatever you do as a company, um, do it in the, in the right way, in line with the, the context. And in DRC, this means, you know, there's a weak governance system, there's an absence of the rule of law, uh, something that struck me in, in the first uh, discussion was indeed uh, the focus on, you know, on, on legal obligations for companies. Um, you know, if there's no rule of law, if you can uh, bribe uh, courts or politicians, it's very hard to, to hold companies accountable. Um, and to, you know, and the government uh, basically is, is absent to, to protect the rights of lo local communities. And of course, uh, this leads to the structural power imbalance. So that's sort of the, uh, what's at stake. Um, now, what, what we learned from this case is that uh, international grievance mechanisms are actually part of a, a solution, not only for Western companies, but also for Chinese companies. Uh, because as we um, sort of, you know, can conclude after this process is that uh, raising the complaint at the CCCMC, um, uh, actually this is likely to have triggered a more collaborative approach by the company because of the reputational and economic damage to Chinese business interests. And that's a very interesting uh, conclusion because it means they still don't care about human rights, but they care about their reputation and their economic interests. Um, so, it, you know, it's basically uh, to say that it's, it might be an effective way to address community impacts and improve human security. And also in line with uh, uh, one of the conclusions of, uh, of Phil Champagne is that international NGO support uh, has proven to be crucial in this case because the communities were not aware of the, of the guidelines by the Chinese authorities. Uh, the local NGO was not able to, to do this on their own without proper funding. So the, the partnership with the international NGO uh, was, was really uh, essential. Um, finally, the, the rationale of the human security approach. Uh, it's possible that the, we don't know for sure because uh, you know, the, the Chinese company is not very open about their, their uh, motivations. But it might be that the case that the Chinese company has concluded that it makes more sense from a business point of view to work constructively with the communities instead of violating their rights and running the reputational and legal risks that I mentioned. Um, again, you know, this is uh, a bit speculative, but it, uh, we see a sort of... Um, um, let's say um, the process that, that uh, we, we have seen is that at first people were very skeptical, even the, the communities themselves, um, when we proposed them to raise a complaint at the level of China, because they, they didn't believe that uh, they would ever listen to, you know, a group of, let's say, um, local communities in somewhere in Congo, 
but apparently uh, it has triggered a process where finally the, the company started to listen. Um, and we don't know about you know the role of the, the CCCMC, to what extent they actually um, exerted pressure on the company. Um, but it, well, the only thing we know is that it worked. So uh, I think this is a very uh, good example of that uh, there are, you know, we, we need creative ways uh, to deal with these problems. And I'm very curious to hear uh, if, if anyone has, um, you know, experiences with Chinese companies and how to deal with them or with uh, companies from other, um, uh, you know, like the, the Brixham uh, countries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for bringing uh, Chinese uh, companies into conversation because they have been very much at the margin of, of conversations about uh, business and, and human rights. And if one thinks about how the conversation on these issues in other contexts uh, has, has advanced, maybe you know what you just shared shared with us um, suggests that there is some, some, some space for, for, for leapfrogging on, on the part of Chinese companies and catching up. Uh, I think the observation that it's, it's the reputational damage uh, and and being part of some of these international um, uh, consultations and conversations on, on these issues matters is, is quite quite relevant. I think what, what I uh, also uh, take out from your presentation is uh, how important it is in context where um, government is weak and potentially where a local civil society is weak to have a, a credible international civil society partner to lend the support uh, and and uh, you know take take this, this these initiatives forward. I mean this is this is as I say maybe one example which is more within that um, traditional business human human rights uh, rights debate. But I think uh, nevertheless has some some important insights in how these company uh, Chinese companies, which as I said, uh, tend to be somewhere on the sideline of these conversations uh, are beginning to respond. Even though mind you, on, uh, uh, in this uh, business and human, UN Business and Human Rights Forum in Geneva, they, they become more and more vocal over the years, trying to assert uh, their, their position and uh, demonstrate uh, some of the work that they have been doing and let me now turn to our last speaker, Juan Andres Cano from Peace Startup in Colombia. Juan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Besna. And thank you everyone for the presentation. I, I, I will have more focus in, try to comment what we are now doing uh, as a, as a, in a project where the human security business framework is, is our, uh, our framework to work. And this project is in Colombia, a kind of pilot of the human security business framework. So I will try to be short because I think we have many things to discuss. And uh, only to start, I'd like to mention that this approach is, is an approach of, uh, I will start for this, for three, plus for, three kind of four, four kinds of different organizations. The, the UNDP agency, the UNHCSR agency, that is a humanitarian agency. This startup is the company I represent and we work principal, principally with uh, entrepreneurs. So our approach is more like how we can connect with uh, international organizations and with businesses to try to innovate. No? So for us, uh, even more than due diligence or even more than think the impact of the business sector, we are trying to think how we can collaborate with them. And of course, in this project, uh, uh, London School of Economics uh, and especially LSE Ideas, Besna and Mary, uh, help us to, to think how we can connect better with the business sector. So to start, I, I like to present this uh, project Alianzas para la Seguridad Humana, Business Partnership for Human Security in English. 
This project uh, has focused in five different municipali municipalities uh, with big transitional challenge. You know, Colombia sent this uh, peace agreement uh, four years ago, and uh, that's, that implies that the country was a star, so continue in a, in a, in a process to, to build development, to build peace, so we uh, start to working in these two, in, in, in these five municipalities. If you see, this is the map of Colombia. They are in very complex areas. Uh, this in the south is, is frontier with Ecuador and is very close to the Pacific. So there the conflict is, uh, is present because it's a territory of um, confrontation. Even if the, if the peace is, well, the peace agreement is there, other groups like the Mexican cartels and the dissidencias of the FARC, of, of the paramilitars, uh, are, are still uh, competing for the control of the territory. And in the north, the other star is, is in a very complex area because we have there a kind of a tapón, no? and it's, it's in a very strategic area where you have connection with the Caribbean or the Atlantic Sea and the Pacific. So in both areas, we have uh, not only a transition and challenge, but at the same time, we have all of the conflict challenge, no? And in this space, um, it's, it's very interesting because I, 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 there is, is a big press uh, that the uh, EPM, that the big um, uh, electric company built. So we are working there close into to close sorry to a big operation of a big company no that this is a colombian company but the I, I, I this does press have a lot of problems in terms of um, security because the press uh, uh, was to crash so they generate a lot of problem for, for for the communities and so so our project is there uh, and we work with big teams, uh, refugees, migrants, ex-combatants. Uh, so this is more or less where, where the project is. Our objective is how we between multiple actors and private sector. It's important to, 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 to have focus here. here. If you see, we, we have this differentiation between multiple actors and private sectors. Uh, I was listening to the conference before, and it's interesting to see how we think sometimes the private sector as a other actor, even though if they have power, uh, they, we need to mention, especially here, because uh, the United Nations and the UNDP and the UN EHR system see the business sector as a, as a um, actor to to, to don't, don't have enough trust. So for this reason, we divide this and our focus is try to create uh, durable solutions in the context of peace building in Colombia. Um, what is, are the main objectives? At the end, this project needs to build strong community capacities, develop markets and alliance. We need to build strong institutions. Part of the projects wants to give to the ma majors and the local institutions capacities to improve their, their um, negotiations with private sector, even with the central government or international cooperation. And uh, we want to share knowledge in a process of dialogues. For this reason, we are always sharing this information in these kind of events. But of course, in each month, we have a local event to talk about the project with the public sector and the academic sector. Los Alia, the, the partners, uh, this is more or less, I, I want to start here. If you see this startup in this project represent the connection with the business sector. Uh, even if we are an NGO, our experience is to work with the business sector to understand the challenge in complex context. And uh, at the same time, we have experience trying to incubate uh, startups in, com in complex context. So, uh, our role here in this project is uh, manage or try to 
uh, raise ideas or try to innovate in, innovate in the way that uh, the business sector it could be involved in these complex areas. Okay. Uh, I mentioned before that uh, this project is a kind of pilot of the human security business pro, uh, project. So this is more or less uh, how we are trying to use the human security business. This is the, the, the framework of the human security business project. And we are using this um, structure to create a scenario of alliance with the business sector. At the beginning, you see there are principles, uh, process and tools. So we are trying to use all of this. And I need to mention that we are not only using that, we are creating some uh, process and tools even more in detail than this uh, framework because uh, the dilemmas of the context at, of the context at the end imply that we need to be more creative in every relation that we try to open with a, with a, with a business partner. So, but the principles are related with that, the, this idea of lift, we start saying that this should be locally driven and context, context sensitive. Sensitive. That that for us means that we start talking with the with the opportunities that the offer of the local markets uh, offer, <laughs> or, or the needs of the market. No, then they the should be inclusive and equitable participation. For us, that imply that we need to help communities to improve their uh, dialogue capacities with the central government and with the business sector, because we see that for the, that communities at the end, they know very well what they want, even they know very well what the, their business should go, but it's not easy for them, the process to negotiate with, uh, with a central business or even more difficult to negotiate with a global business. The other is future oriented. This project is a three-year project, but our vision in this is how we can create long-term relationships and create joint commitment and responsibilities for more time than the project. The other is trust. Of course, we are, we are always trying to build trust. And pues, as I mentioned before, if you see the, the geography of the project, that is not, not easy. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that we all are always the lack of trust in international cooperation and business, the lack of international cooperation, of lack of trust uh, between the countries. And I think the worst <laughs> is local authorities. No, you know there is a lot of uh, is a gap of the presence of the state and people are always uh, uncomfortable to talk with the local authority. Uh, and the, uh, the final goal is principle, the, uh, the final principle, sorry, is uh, sharing. How we can show that we can share goals, benefits, and interests. In terms of process, uh, this project is a three-year project, but at the beginning we start mapping the participants. Now we know very well who is in the territory, who need, who wants to work in this project, who one could be involved in the value chains that we are trying to work. And we start doing consultation to identify needs and risks. Uh, we agree at least with the partners of the project in a baseline of target objectives. Uh, now we have a very good access of capacities of the communities and how they are seeing their opportunities and their needs. And now we are trying to, uh, this is of course, uh, I am very, uh, transparency here. We are trying to manage protocols. This is a huge challenge. If you think that we are working at the same time with a, with, with a development agency and with a humanitarian agency, they have even two different rules to follow, no? Uh, and they are always bureaucracy to, to, well, to work with, no? Uh, uh, but if you put that conversations to the private sector, uh, at the end for them it's very difficult to navigate uh, these different uh, scenarios of, of, of rules. 
And that rules in a country like Colombia are always intentional because some areas need humanitarian assistance and other are in a process to uh, development in terms of uh, economic growth or, or even in, in investment of infrastructure and so on. So we are working a lot in management protocols and I think this is now in this moment of the project, one of the biggest challenge. Uh, now, of course, the, all of the process of monitoring and evaluation is always a process to rethink the project uh, and the review process and the guarantee of grievance process is part of what we are thinking to open in the process. In terms of tools, pues, we have this consultation methodology, action shared list, how we can use ICT communications for an information sharing. This project start, starts be, before of the pandemic. So we should uh, have a lot of focus in this ICT enabled communication and information sharing because all of the relation that we have with the communities uh, use internet to connect. But, but of course, Colombia have a more or less than 60% of lack of connectivity in rural areas. So we have a huge challenge. So we, need, we decide to reinvest some of the travel budget and some even the investment budget in invest uh, in some project to to ensure that people will be connected of course all of the tool is training documentation and again monitoring and evaluation uh, this is this is of course I, I am not an expert in the human security framework but this is how we are we are trying to use it to work in these municipalities with that communities and with the business so I, I like to mention that other um, framework that we are using is, of course, the SDG 17. Um, this is at the end for us. The SDG 17 is more useful to say we are with the SDGs. We are trying to work together because we know that we need the business sector because we know that we need the 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 the, the possibility to work together. Um, and we we start to use even more the SDG 17 because we understand that for the business sector, the SDG 17 is uh, very relevant, no? because it's the, the, the easy way to connect uh, what we want to do with what they are trying to do in other uh, goals, in, in other goals of the SDGs, of course, so, uh, to say. Um, we have this Marco uh, Normativo, a framework of rules, Sorry, because the Spanish English <laughs> version of the presentation. But for us, uh, this 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 slide is very useful because I I listened before all of this tension between humanitarian law, human rights law, human security frameworks, and so on. And for us, that at the end complex because once we start with the business sector, then we need to consult with the human human nation uh, institution, how we can do a due diligence to create the partnerships. So now we are uh, confronting uh, the protocol that we need to use for this. Um, i like to mention one example of this. I am in charge of the dam in the in Ituango, no? For, for uh, UNHCSR, they can't work with, with them because they have a lot of concerns about the impact of human rights of the EPL, you know? But for uh, UNDP at the same time, uh, EPM is a kind of development partner because they have the resources, they have the presence, the presence in the territory. So now we are confronting a, a, a attention uh, about how we can work with EPM because EPM is there, EPM is one of the biggest actors in the area and with a lot of resources, but at the same time have this um, in the in her uh, recent past uh, part of the responsible of some impacts for the communities. So this is more or less what we are in, 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 trying to solve in this project. Uh, to finish, we at the end, you know, projects means we you have goals and you need to uh, achieve something. Even if you are, uh, your um, goal is learn and so on, we need to achieve some concrete alliance. So we decide recently that we have 
three lines of alliance. The first is digital transformation and how we can help communities to start a digital transformation. The second is how we can help them to finance their vision and how we can connect different actors in the finance chain to try to build a blended finance strategy and how we can do market connections. So with these three lines, we start to work in this uh, vision of uh, create um, uh, value chains to ask the business sector in concrete possibilities where they can, they can help us to uh, grow our business. So we start this on our model is, this is a model, for example, for the line of digital transformation. So we, we understand that for the digital transformation, we need infrastructure, infrastructure. The other is we need to give them access because sometimes you have the infrastructure, but people need uh, money to pay for the connection. And at the same time, they need uh, terminals, no, uh, cell phones, computers, and so on. So we are we are trying to ask uh, partners how we can uh, increase the access. What people are uses doing some uses for the connectivity. So now we are open a conversation with Facebook and with uh, the people in the team of Amazon Web Services, saying they are using internet, uh, even the the free. A Wi-Fi connectivity that the state pay for uh, see YouTube, Facebook, and WhatsApp. So their their priorities is that of the communities. So how we can move that use for an, a kind of exploitation to build the transformation. Uh, and in that sense, our project um, try to to move that uses for a kind of exploitation. And this is this is uh, uh, the kind of model more in detail. It's in Spanish. Sorry. Uh, I didn't have enough time to to change this uh, because this is very recent in the project. But but for me, it was important to to show you because at the end we have this model of infrastructure access uses and exploitation, and how we are putting in the table some of the um, answers to that change of digital transformation, and we are asking the business sector opportunities of innovations. For example, in terms of infrastructure, we open a conversation with Ispasat or with the Elon Musk company of the, Ispasat uh, um, is, well, the, the other company that is working in, in satellites in um, lower uh, altitude uh, to see what, if, if they want to, to test their technologies in these territories because with their uh, we have the president of the United Nation, we have present with other business. What we need and what is the potential alliance that we need in each is a chain of the value chain of the digital transformation. And if you see in this line, sorry, in this line, uh, the second line, what are the uh, project initiatives uh, where we are working, trying to solve some of the challenge that we have in all of the value chain. With this, the conversation with the business sector uh, was even more uh, um, more connected with the principles of the project. No, with that we build trust because they know that we have a clear vision about what we can do because they understand we understand the problem because they understand that we have we could have some interest in long term. So uh, I like to, to see. To, to show this because uh, I think this is the I, I, internet provider in rural areas. Uh, so with them, we, we, are, we try to, we build an alliance with that for UNDP. And with that, we are, uh, this project is locally driving, driving because they have 100 and, well, 1,000 and 100 Wi-Fi rural points. They are inclusive because to start, they, we are starting an internet connection free for the, for the first six months. So we are trying to, with that, collect data about what, what is the using of internet in these areas. This is future oriented because even we are only pay, paying for six months, the project is for two year finance uh, of the government and other next years for the international cooperation and a commitment of in red and PACTE to, try to build a sustainable solution for rural connectivity. 
This project is based in trust because at the end we don't know what would happen. So in Redis commitment, pain of this commitment, and, and we in this startup are committed with that. We are sharing uh, uh, a lot because in red wins because they are building susta a sustainable model, pay not wins because they are paying less to ensure connectivity. And we, we as a project uh, win because we are trying to, to build some innovative way to rural areas. In terms of procedure, well, of course, all of these more challenges, I don't want to have focus here because I think my time is over. Uh, we are doing the same in terms of capital. I remember the second line of the project is where is the gap in capital? So we are seeing here in Colombia, Colombia is uh, in Latin America, the, the second or the third country in terms of uh, risk capital. But we are now mapping where is the needs in terms of capital to try to talk where, where the money uh, should uh, go. Once we know that some grants starts in $1,000, but once we know that risk capital is a big gap in, uh, before $10,000 and so on and so forth. So with that, is we are approaching uh, fintechs, local bank, special credit lines, uh, entrepreneur um, acceleration program to say, here is the gap that we have in the, in the territories. Do you want to work with us? as an alliance, of course, following the principles that the human security is my framework. We are doing the same with the market in terms of production, transformation, logistics, and commercialization, that that's big gaps in terms of commercialization in that areas. So of, again, our conversation here is, you have a potential to have us with production, you have a potential to regenerate transformation in the product, you have a innovative uh, logistics. Uh, you know, Colombia have a big gap in, uh, transport and road infrastructure. So how we can think in ways to uh, use other resources to uh, improve that infrastructure, which is part of that we are working, but don't, not, we are not working lonely, uh, well, no, uh, only in the project, we are trying to work with the business sector directly in this uh, challenge, large opportunities. The, this is the step-by-step -step to consolidate the alliance. And with this, we start with an explore, exploratory uh, meetings. Then we should do a kind of diligent, uh, due diligence uh, lead by PNUD. But now we understand that we need to do the due diligence that uh, the UNHCR as, are asking us for do. Then we define some, um, the, what, what the, Alliance will put in the table the compliance process and the operational execution. At the end, this is more or less all of the statements. Uh, and with that, I think, uh, I, I hope that th this could be useful for you. And I'm very happy to discuss with all of you what you mentioned and what we are doing. Thank you, Vesna and all of you. Thank you very much, Juan. Uh, I'm very conscious we are running out of time, so I'm going to take a decision and extend this um, session by five minutes. Before we go back to, to uh, discussion, may I just uh, invite uh, Christian to introduce himself. He's managed to join us after all. Please, Christian. Hello. Hello to Hi. all. Hello. Um, um, my name is uh, Christian Buenda, and I live to uh, Lubumbashi in DRC. My English is very bad. I will speak French, and uh, Mark uh, will uh, translate. Mark. Que tu es prêt? Oui, pas de problème. Ok, euh, d'abord je voulais m'excuser pour euh, la petite confusion que j'ai eue pour euh, l'horaire, euh, étant donné euh, l'heure de Londres et l'heure de Lubumbashi et, et tous les changements qu'il y a eu en Europe entre l'heure d'hiver et l'heure d'été. So I first would like to apologize for the confusion in the time because of the change in the winter versus summertime. 
which caused me to to be uh, confused about the starting time. Donc je devais quitter le bureau et rentrer vite dans la maison pour prendre la la conférence. So I had to leave the office and go back home to uh, join the conference. Uh, parce que nous sommes uh, sous uh, couvre-feu uh, à cause de, du COVID-19. Because we are in a curfew because of COVID-19. Okay. Donc, uh, mais je suis là, je, je suis prêt à participer uh, au reste de la discussion s'il y a des uh, questions sur la présentation qui a été faite tout à l'heure par Marc. So I'm here just to answer any questions on the presentation that Mark has been uh, providing. Okay, merci. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, as I said initially, we were going to have a round of uh, reflections among the panelists, but I think uh, I will uh, allow the audience to ask the question first, given how little time um, is left. So there is one question uh, for all of you to uh, clarify the main results from the initiatives that you have presented here. If you can summarize in a couple of points what you think is the most relevant uh, result, that would be uh, welcome. Phil, would you like to start? Sure. Um, maybe the risk of repeating myself, uh, myself I suppose, um, there are two things that were maybe, one was reinforced by other speakers, I think, and that is, you know, if, if the purpose of our discussion is to, uh, to you know, to discuss how, how we can engage business more in delivering human security, um, and collaborating then the issue about champions within companies but also the level at which those uh, company representatives engage I think is critical and that seems to have kind of been echoed in the in the presentations and the second which which I don't know it's it's kind of something which I haven't heard I, I, I'm struggling to kind of see if there is a thread in the pres presentations running through this, but it, it, it is the one about companies' attachment to place. And I think the challenge where maybe our work is more most uh, effective or, or it can be most successful is where companies do have that attachment, uh, attachment to place. But maybe as we discussed with Chinese companies earlier, maybe part of the problem is, is when companies don't seem to have an attachment to place in the communities and the social networks where they're working and that seems to be where, where maybe the the difficulty lies one of the difficulties thank you thank you i, mean, I think that, that that's a very important point if we are talking about uh, relation building social capital building then that aspect of where the company fits in terms of social networks is incredibly important. So I would agree with you. Who would like to go next? Jackson? Yes, please. Okay, so um, I mentioned about uh, innovation and uh, emphasizing uh, from the previous uh, session that uh, we need to go beyond the CSR uh, program which is traditional. Uh, but uh, the, the main sources for us uh, was that uh, we were able to uh, get communities set up, I mean, or train and set up their own uh, 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 corporate groups in order to provide service to these uh, uh, adjacent companies. This is very crucial for us because um, when the community feel that sense of selling their service, instead of, you know, hoping that they will get employed, you know, recruited and employed by the companies because they do not have the skills required. Once they get that sense that they are able to sell service to these companies, of course, the whole issue of our peace, you know, civility and harmony will be promoted. So our focus 
and you know interest was to ensure that uh, you know people, especially these young people living around these uh, adjacent communities have some sellable skills. Thank you. Thank you, Jackson. Who would like to go next? Mark, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, give the floor to uh, Christian because uh, I think it's interesting and important also to hear his perspective on the, on the Chinese company company's presence. So Christian, est-ce que tu peux uh, nous donner uh, ton, ton avis sur la présence de, des entreprises chinoises um, à, à Katanga et uh, quelle est la, la conclusion clé de votre recherche? Euh, en parlant de manière globale, je dirais d'abord que euh, les investissements miniers chinois sont les plus importants dans la province du Katanga. Euh, plus de 95% des entreprises minières présentes au Katanga sont d'origine chinoise. Ok, so first of all, the Chinese presence is, uh, is very uh, large. Uh, over 90% of the mining companies are of Chinese origin in Katanga. Euh, Je dois préciser que avant que euh, les entreprises chinoises n'arrivent, euh, le Katanga étant une, euh, une région essentiellement minière, euh, l'expérience que les communautés avaient de l'exploitation minière, c'était l'expérience des entreprises européennes d'origine européenne qui fonctionnaient avant. Mm -hmm. So before the arrival of the Chinese companies, it was mostly European companies that uh, were present and that were exploiting uh, minerals. Donc tout ce qui tout ce qui se passe maintenant pour les communautés, c'est généralement en termes de comparaison en ce qui concerne les impacts sur le plan environnemental et sur le plan social. So uh, it's uh, actually uh, a matter of comparing our experiences with uh, the, the experience before and uh, after the arrival of Chinese companies, both in environmental and social impacts. Et uh, ce qu'il faut dire, c'est que um, les uh, l'impact est très négatif et le ressentiment des des communautés est très profond. Euh, lorsque les entreprises chinoises sont arrivées, on pensait que c'était des investissements qui auraient les mêmes impacts sociaux que les investissements européens d'antan. Mais malheureusement, ça n'a pas été le cas. C'est beaucoup plus la, la, la destruction de l'environnement et c'est beaucoup plus les, les, la violation des droits des communautés dont il, dont il est question. So compared to uh, the experience with European companies, the impacts are very negative and uh, the population, you know, really feels disappointed because they expected to have more or less the same um, relationship with, as with the European companies. But uh, in reality, uh, there were a lot of negative environmental impacts um, as well as, uh, you know, violation of their rights. Alors, ce que je dois dire aussi, c'est que je voudrais donner une crainte tout à fait personnelle que moi j'ai, c'est que euh, je sens un ressentiment croissant au sein des communautés qui, qui peut déboucher sur euh, des situations, des conflits comparables à ce qui est en train de se passer dans le delta du Niger. Euh, une autre fois, je n'ai pas suivi la dernière euh, chose que tu dis. Oui. Euh, bon, tu sais que dans le delta du Niger, on, on voit des, des, euh, des groupes armés, des gens, de, des locaux qui s'attaquent à des entreprises. Et ma crainte, c'est que dans les années qui viennent, qu'on puisse voir quelque chose de pareil surgir aussi euh, au Katanga, tellement les gens sont mécontents des impacts négatifs des entreprises chinoises. Mais tu parles du Niger, n'est-ce pas? Oui, je dis ceci. Euh, 
que personnellement, j'ai la crainte de voir l'expérience du Niger se répéter au Katanga voilà. avec l'exaspération, le mécontentement des, des communautés. Okay, C'est okay. une crainte personnelle que moi. So, um, sorry, I had, I had some trouble due to the connection. So the, the personal fear that uh, I would like to express is that uh, we might have a similar situation like uh, we see, see in Niger, um, where you see armed groups um, starting to, you know, to uh, basically uh, fight the companies because uh, they feel marginalized and because they are not uh, happy with the way the companies uh, are behaving and, and not sharing the benefits. Parce que toute l'action des entreprises chinoises euh, est plus nocive encore à cause de la faiblesse de l'État congolais. Hein? Et, et c'est ce qui fait que l'impact négatif est beaucoup plus grand parce que l'État est faible et ne sait pas protéger les communautés. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, actually uh, even uh, made worse because the uh, Congolese state is not able to protect uh, the communities and you know oh. so they are they are not doing anything against uh, the violations. C'est à cause de ça que moi je, je me dis euh, pour euh, bien euh, euh, aider les entreprises à, à, à prendre en compte des droits des communautés pour moi la politique ou la stratégie idéale, c'est de jouer avec le pays d'origine, avec la Chine, comme nous essayons de le faire avec le cas de Mabende, et qui, à notre surprise, je dois dire, commence à porter des fruits. So for me, the solution is to uh, engage with, um, with, with China, with mainland China, um, and to my surprise, actually, this uh, has succeeded uh, in... Uh, you know, moving uh, ahead in the, in the conversation with the company. Uh, donc, c'est ça. Mais je dois dire que c'est un cas exceptionnel. De manière générale, les entreprises chinoises, et je pense que c'est un élément de leur euh, culture, ne comprennent même pas que euh, l'entreprise qui s'entend très bien avec euh, l'État puisse être amené à rendre compte à la communauté ou aux organisations de la société civile. Donc, ce n'est pas dans leur culture, c'est ce que j'ai euh, compris. Ils ne comprennent pas que cela soit faisable. OK, so in my experience, the, the Chinese companies, they, they think when they have a relationship with the government, uh, they don't need any, um, you know, any let's say, um, engagement with the communities or with the CSOs to succeed. And that's like a, a, a cultural uh, difference. So, um, Christian, tu peux uh, finir? Parce que le temps marche très vite. Oui, oui, oui. Oui, 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 je m'arrête par là. Merci. Okay, I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian, for bringing this additional insights. Uh, I would like to give the opportunity to Ms. Herrera and Juan for any last uh, comments, reflections they would like to make. Ms. Thank Herrera, you. please. Uh, very quick, just a very relevant uh, re result on our part is that we, we have been able to work together with the community on developing individual and collective um, uh, capabilities. That, that for us is one of the most important results and, and from that, we have been able to develop leadership locally. And, and uh, that is for us one of the most relevant things because this is the way in which the community takes the ownership of their own development. Thank you very much. Uh, Juan, any last yeah. thoughts? Yeah. thoughts? Very briefly, I think the, the most important achievement that we are building here is the opportunity to build some innovative alliance working together with the community and the business sector to solve challenge in relevant world uh, challenge like digital transformation, financing and access to market. I think that, that is what, what we are achieving here. Thank you very much. Uh, I think 
you know, these are very unique experiences and the entry points uh, that each of you uh, have taken are, are different. But despite that, you know, one, can, one can actually identify some, some building blocks which, which are common and which are, which are interesting for rethinking, you know, how human security can serve as a framework to, to foster business contribution to, to, to development uh, and peace. Uh, I do apologize for, <laughs> for this um, overrun. Sometimes, you know, it, it, can, it cannot be helped, but I would like to thank you very, very much for your contribution. Uh, I hope that all of you will be able to uh, join us tomorrow for the second day of, of our conference when we will be looking at different approaches and tools uh, and also having conversation you know, um, where does the research agenda on, on these issues uh, go forward uh, after, after our deliberations over these two days. Thank you very much and have a very good evening.